Now that we have the structure of a membrane, we can actually look at how it controls what comes in and what goes out of the cell. Cells need all sorts of things in order to carry out the many functions that they do, but also they're going to make waste, which they need to get rid of. And we're going to look in this section at the various different ways that molecules can move in and out of these cells. Now, because of the properties of the phospholipid bilayer, certain molecules can cross in between the phospholipids by diffusion from one side of the cell membrane to the other, uh, and some molecules can't. Small uncharged molecules, things like gases, things like carbon dioxide and oxygen, these tend to be able to pass through between the phospholipids by diffusion. Water, although it is slightly charged, it is a polar molecule, it can actually also pass between these phospholipids, although it's not um, that quick a process. But if you think about something like glucose or amino acids, for example, which are big molecules, they're too large to fit between the gaps in the phospholipids, and they can't pass through. Charged molecules like ions are actually repelled. Um, they may be very, very small, but because of their charge, it means they can't cross the hydrophobic barrier created by the fatty acid chains in the middle of the membrane. They get repelled and they can't cross the membrane either by diffusion. Now diffusion is just the movement of molecules from an area of high concentration or an area of low concentration. It's a passive process, it doesn't require any energy, it just relies on the fact that molecules can move around randomly and therefore over a period of time they tend to spread out from when there are lots of them to where there aren't very many of them. Now the rate of diffusion relies on various things. It relies on a concentration gradient. The more of a substance you've got on one side of the membrane to the other, the faster the rate of diffusion will be. If there's a bigger surface area for diffusion to take place, that will also increase its rate. The distance the molecules have to travel will also affect how fast diffusion happens. The shorter the distance, the faster the rate of diffusion. The temperature also affects the rate of diffusion. At higher temperatures, molecules have more kinetic energy and they will move around quicker and faster and therefore diffusion will happen quicker. So these molecules, the large molecules and the charged uh, ions, how do they get across the membrane? Well, they can cross by a process called facilitated diffusion, which basically means that they are helped across from one side to the other. And they are helped across by special proteins called transport proteins. Now, some transport proteins are called channel proteins, and they work almost like a little tunnel through the membrane. They can be gated, uh, which allows them to either be open or closed, depending on what the cell needs. Um, for example, here is a sodium channel, and it's going to allow this charged sodium ion, which would normally be repelled by the fatty acids uh, in the bilayer. Uh, it's not as protected by this protein channel, and it can pass from one side to the other from an air of high concentration to an air of low concentration. There is another type of transport protein called a carrier protein. Now these are used to move the large molecules, for example, glucose. They actually change shape in order to move the molecule from one side to the other. And they are very specific to an individual molecule. So facilitated diffusion is a passive process. It means it doesn't require any energy. Molecules move down their concentration gradients from air of high concentration to air of low concentration using membrane transport proteins. Now here is a graph showing what happens to the rate of diffusion as you increase the molecule concentration of the molecule, for example, glucose in this case, on one side of the membrane. Now as we increase the concentration gradient, we get a faster rate of diffusion which is unsurprising, that's what happens in normal diffusion. But because this is facilitated diffusion, there becomes a point where this graph plateaus, it levels off. And that is because at that point, it doesn't matter how much more glucose we add to uh, that side of the membrane, um, all of the protein channels, the transport channel proteins, are occupied, they're all being used, they're saturated. So it can't go at any faster rate and the rate just levels off. Now sometimes you want to be able to move a particle or molecule against its concentration gradient from where it's a low concentration to where it is a high concentration. To do this you're going to need energy in the form of ATP which we get from cellular respiration. Now this energy is used to pump uh, these molecules from where they are in a low concentration to where they have high concentration. In order to do that we're going to need a carrier protein. Now the carrier protein uh, binds to the molecule we want to move across and using ATP, which is 
converted into ADP and phosphate, the energy that is given off is used to change the shape of the molecule and move it against its concentration gradient. Cells will require mitochondria in order to generate the ATP during cellular respiration for this process to occur. There are some very specialized carrier proteins, one of which is called the sodium potassium pump. Now it's found in the membrane of neurons, nerve cells, and its job is to actively pump out three sodium ions and, um, from the cytoplasm of the cell out of the cell across the membrane using ATP and also at the same time to pump two potassium ions into the cell cytoplasm. Those potassium ions actually then leak back out by facilitated diffusion through a potassium channel and can then be pumped back in at the same time as pumping back three sodiums back out. And if this process carries on and carries on and carries on, what you will get is a huge concentration of sodium ions being built up outside of the cell. And it's this that is used in order to generate an impulse in a neuron. Now you're gonna learn a lot more about how that works in section 3.3 .3 of the pre-U course. Now sometimes cells need to take in large quantities of material very, very quickly, or get rid of a large amount of waste very, very quickly. Now, carrier proteins and channel proteins are not gonna be suitable for doing this. So the cell needs to carry out a type of transport which we call bulk transport. Now, if it's moving things into the cell, it's what we call endocytosis. And if these sub it's moving substances out of the cell, it's what we call exocytosis. Bulk transport works because of the fluid nature of the phospholipid bilayer. You can actually pinch off whole sections of the phospholipid bilayer uh, to make vesicles within the cell. Or you can uh, actually fuse these vesicles back into the membrane to move thick substances out of the cell via exocytosis. Now there are two main types of endocytosis. Phagocytosis, which is a bit like cell eating, where cells take in um, uh, food molecules or solid particles or whole organisms and there is pinocytosis where cells take in fluid so it's a bit like cell drinking. Pinocytosis is carried out by all eukaryotic cells but phagocytosis is usually carried out by particular specialized cells for example the macrophages which are a type of white blood cell um, which are used to engulf bacteria in the immune system. What they do is they take in the bacteria by phagocytosis and then they break down these bacteria using lysosomes. In exocytosis, proteins made by the ribosomes uh, and transported to the Golgi for processing can actually be secreted from the cell. They are moved around in vesicles controlled by microtubules. Um, you can have something called constitutive secretion which happens in all cells, where soluble proteins are continually secreted, and it can also supply the membrane with new lipids and new proteins that can be added in. Or you can have regulated secretion, where proteins get stored in vesicles until an extracellular signal is provided, and then uh, they are fused with the membrane and release these proteins out of the cell. The signal for regulated secretion quite, can quite often be calcium ions, for example, in insulin secretion and at the synapses of neurons. Now here's the synapse. Now the synapse works via um, neurotransmitter chemicals that are released from vesicles at the presynaptic membrane. The release of these neurotransmitter chemicals is stimulated by an influx of calcium ions. Once they diffuse across the other, to the other side and initiate an impulse in the postsynaptic uh, neuron, they then need to be broken down and brought back to the presynaptic neuron to be used again. So they are reabsorbed back into the presynaptic neuron via pinocytosis. So this is an example, the synapse, where we see both endocytosis and exocytosis occurring. This whole process of the synapse and how the synapse works is covered in much more detail in section 3.3. So this table here just summarizes all the different methods of transport that we've been looking at. Why not pause the video here and make some notes on this section. Now water moves across a membrane by a special type of diffusion called osmosis. It moves from an area of high water potential to low water potential.
Water potential is measured in something called kilopascals, and it has this symbol here. Now, pure water actually has a water potential of zero kilopascals, and the more solute you dissolve in the water, the lower the water potential comes, so it actually goes into negative numbers. The definition of osmosis is the net movement of water molecules through a partially permeable membrane from a region of high water potential to a region of lower water potential. So here on this diagram, you can see an area of high water potential of pure water on the right-hand side, which would have a water potential of zero kilopascals. Now on the left-hand side of this membrane, the water potential is lower, and that is because of the sugar molecules. Now when you dissolve a solute in water, it interacts with the mortar molecules around it, and it stops them from being able to, to move. So there is less free water molecules over there, so there is a lower water potential because of the dissolved solute. The more you dissolve into the water, the lower the water potential will become. So in this diagram, you can see that water has moved across the partially permeable membrane to the lower water potential where the salt molecules are, and the volume has increased. But now the water potential will be equal on both sides of the membrane. Tonicity is a measure of how much solute is dissolved in a substance. If the solution is what we call hypertonic, then it has lots of solute dissolved in it. If it's hypotonic, then it has very little of the solute dissolved in it. If it's isotonic, then it has the same on both sides of the membrane. A 0.9% sodium chloride solution is known to be isotonic to the cytoplasm of red blood cells. So when you get put on a drip in hospital, a saline drip, it's saline so that it is isotonic to your cells, so that your cells do not swell up or shrink because of osmosis. If animal cells are placed in a hypotonic solution, water will move into them and they will burst, what we call lysis. If they're placed in a hypertonic solution, then water will move out of them and they become more shriveled and crinkled into what we call crenated cells. Plant cells are a bit different. They have a cell wall which is extremely strong. It's made of cellulose and it can withstand extremely high pressures. And this means that when water moves into a plant cell, it becomes turgid. It doesn't burst, it becomes turgid. And that's very important because it gives the cell turgor pressure, which allows the plant to stand upright. If a plant cell is placed in hypertonic solution, water will move out of the cytoplasm, out of the vacuole, the cell sap, and the cell will become plasmalized as the membrane uh, shrinks and pulls away from the cell wall. The cell wall won't change uh, shape, but the membrane will shrink and pull in. So here's a plant cell that's been placed um, in pure water, which has a high water potential. Remember, there is water inside the cell itself, but there is also a lot of solutes dissolved inside the cell sap and in the cytoplasm. So water will want to move in from the area of high water potential to the area of low water potential inside the cell. Now, as water moves in, the cell sap, the cytoplasm, um, actually starts to swell and it actually starts to put pressure back on the cell wall. This is what's known as the pressure potential. Now this is always a positive value. Now the dissolved solutes create a solute potential, which is always negative, as it's always trying to draw water in. And therefore, if you want to look at the total water potential of a plant cell, you need to combine these two figures. So water potential of a plant cell equals the solute potential, which is caused by the dissolved solute in the, in the actual cell, which is wanting to draw more water in. Um, combined with the pressure potential, which is forcing, wanting to force water out because of the pressure of the water building up inside the cell. So water potential is a combination of these two potentials. Now when a plant cell is placed in hypertonic solution, it will lose water. The living part of the cell, which is also known as the protoplast, the cytoplasm and the, and the cell sap, will start to shrink. And it will be a very specific point where it is no longer putting any pressure on the cell wall. It hasn't shrunk so much that we can see it as being a fully plasmalized cell, but it is now no longer putting any pressure on the cell wall, and it's what we call, uh, the pressure potential is zero. And we call this state incipient plasmolysis. So at this point, incipient plasmolysis, the water potential is just equal to the solute potential because the pressure potential is now zero. Now, this is the point, we want to know quite often what this point is in plant cells, but it's very hard, you can't see it down a microscope. 
So what we have to do is we have to put the cells in a range of solutions and find the point where we, when we count the cells, 50% um, of them are plasmalized and 50% of them are non-plasmalized. And on average, therefore, in the, all the cells, we're, we are looking at incipient plasmolysis. Now with osmosis, there is lots of different terminology that can quite often mean the same thing. So it's important to understand that uh, water moves from a dilute solution to a concentrated solution, from a low concentration of solute to a high concentration of solute, from high water potential to low water potential, or from a low osmotic pressure to a high osmotic pressure. Quite often exam questions will mix and match these terms to try and make sure that you understand um, exactly what they mean.